So it is uh, with a great deal of pleasure that I'll ask our guest of honor to come to the podium now. Dr. Rick Delamardo needs no introduction. Um, he is associated with UCLA, but works at St. John's Hospital in uh, Los Angeles as well. He's written the Sentinel works on uh, timing of cord and cauda decompression. So thank you for being here, Rick. Let me start out by the, telling you that I don't have the answers to all the cervical spine uh, problems, and I don't think anybody does. It's a difficult area to come up with uh, solutions. These are difficult patients. Spinal cord injury is a devastating injury. We are making progress uh, in both the pathophysiology, the treatment, and we're a long ways away, but we are trying to get there. I'll go through uh, some of the pathophysiology and then some of my thoughts as well uh, on this issue. I'd like to uh, just start out with, you know, we're seeing much, many more patients with severe injuries because of uh, athletic events, etc. We get these patients, they live. Here's a typical head impaction, that's a quadriplegic there. I'll show you a recent patient of mine here. Many of you have read about Lafitte Pinkai about three months ago at Santa Anita. He, uh, the most successful jockey to ever be in horse racing, over 95 victories. Three months ago, he was riding here, and you'll see a couple different views of this. The tremendous impact here of, hope you can uh, see what happens to his head. He just impales his head into the ground. Another view here. Tremendous forces that we see in many of these athletic injuries that cause a neck and head injury. Watch right here as he... Boom. Horse rolls over him. Here was a case of mine several years ago uh, that was flown in by helicopter within about an hour and a half. This happened on the beach in, in uh, West Los Angeles, Santa Monica. And you'll notice the complete transection of the spinal cord. I've had about three of these that I could document complete transection of the spinal cord. This is unusual uh, to have complete transection, but uh, herein lies part of the problem and where our research is going uh, with these type of cases. Obviously, there's no uh, surgery at this point. Decompress it is going to recover that spinal cord. Critical is whether these are complete or incomplete. Now, when we deal with complete injuries, uh, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about neural recovery, et cetera. The incompletes can have dramatic improvement, as you know, right away. The initial insult, and I showed these uh, impacts to show the tremendous energy that's involved, that initial insult, there's nothing we can do about that. The secondary mechanisms of injury is where our treatment generally comes into pl play. The secondary mechanisms that enlarge the lesion and determine the extent of, many times, the functional impairment. This is a complex uh, Secondary spread occurs first longitudinally in the gray matter, then in the white matter. May encompass several levels above and below the original in injury, and hopefully with some of our uh, treatments, we can avoid that progression above and below. Typical diagram showing the initial impact of injury in the inner circle there, and the secondary mechanisms that affect it up and down that spinal cord. It's a very complex cascade of biomechanical events, poorly understood. We are making progress in that area. After that initial insult, we see the hemorrhage and inflammation occur, and this is primarily in the central gray matter. This is a slide by uh, Rauschnick that shows, and this was a gentleman who died in an automobile accident, uh, and you can see the impact where the cord injury occurred, but look at the secondary hematoma and the hemorrhage that occurs in that spinal cord. On a systemic level, there's clearly the autonomic nervous system dysfunction, the bradycardia, the hypotension, and this is in some, one of the areas that we can have a, an immediate impact on how we treat these uh, patients. These all contribute to an impaired spinal cord perfusion, part of the ischemia event. Here's a slide uh, that shows the tenuous vascularity of the spinal cord, and uh, you can see here the ridicular nature of how the blood supply comes in, not only central cord compression, but sometimes we just see foraminal compression that can give complete cord injuries and most likely has to do with compressing off the vascular supply coming into the spinal cord. And this was a case uh, that we had of a football player that had a severe injury. Notice the collapse of that lamina, both sides, severe compression down that I believe could, one can conceive of giving the ischemia to the spinal cord. Here was that exact patient once that loose lamina was removed, and you can see the tremendous uh, erythema contusion right on top of that exiting nerve root and how that could affect the vascular supply. 
Experimental studies in spinal cord injury have shown the increased uh, tissue water content, the sodium and lactate, uh, again, very complex. A decrease in the extracellular calcium, the oxygenation, uh, as well as the metabolism. The overall scenario of cord injury involves the ischemia, the hypoxia, the uncoupling of the oxidative phosphorylation and the glycolysis uh, that occurs. Uh, there, when, when you look at it on a, uh, in, a, in a, a picture such as this, you can see here the severed axons, the so many things going on, you can't pinpoint, is it just the pressure, is it just the ischemia? Uh, we're finding out there's so many factors involved here on a cellular level that uh, the pathophysiology of this secondary injury has many theories that have been proposed over the years and it has to do with all the elements that are inside on a, uh, on a molecular level. A few of the theories, the free radical theory that has the rapid depletion of antioxidants, oxygen free radicals accumulate and attack membrane lipids, proteins and nucleic acids and they think that's why the membranes break down and we see this uh, cellular death. The uh, lipids are produced causing cell membranes to fail. The calcium theory, influx of the extracellular calcium, clearly been shown uh, with the proteases and phosphatases. They interrupt the mitochondrial activity and disrupt cell membranes, um, potentially increase the scarring and inhibit a, a proper healing process. The opiate theory, based on evidence that the endogenous opiates may propagate secondary spinal cord injury. Many of you are well aware of the open antagonist uh, literature on naloxone that reported to improve neurologic recovery in experimental cord injury. Very controversial. Uh, many of us have not been able to replicate that um, in both uh, human studies as well as uh, animal studies. Inflammatory series, or the inflammatory theory, this has been uh, highly touted. This is where our uh, NASIS and the steroids all come in. The inflammatory substances, prostaglandins, uh, platelet activating factor serotonin, they accumulate in the injured spinal cord tissue and are certainly mediators of this secondary tissue damage. There's been extensive testing of these anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, the histologic manifications uh, of all these processes are necrosis of the central gray matter in the first hours after injury, cystic degeneration, and scar tissue extends into the axonal tracts. And this is, affects us in our, as recovery may or may not take place in the months later, is there a barrier to the axonal growth with the scar tissue that is formed? Leads us to the, how we have come over the past couple of decades in treatment, the pharmacological uh, interventions that are under investigation. We've talked about naloxone, uh, the methylprednisolone, the corticosteroids, which we'll talk briefly about, as well as the multiple other drugs here, the ganglicides. Um, now the rationale behind the methylprednisolone is the reduction of excitatory amino acid neurotoxicity. The inhibit of the lipid peroxidation, hopefully uh, uh, not allowing so many cells to disrupt with their membranes and maybe keep them uh, intact so that they can function in a healing fashion. Um, this has been a controversial area and a, uh, I'm sure you've had a lot of discussions on this up as well. There have been many litigation cases on how do you use steroids. And in brief, NASA's two with, was the National Acute Spinal Cord Injury in 1990 completed. Conclusion was IV high-dose methylprednisolone improved clinical outcomes. And I'm sure you all remember, I do, when it came out in the USA Today. You know, before we saw it in any uh, peer-reviewed journals, here the newspaper had it, and we were supposed to be using it. Um, they did 487 patients, steroids, naloxone, and placebo. They determined that patients who received high-dose steroids within eight hours had better recovery of neurologic function when compared to the placebo. So the problems with this was very controversial and it has really come to light now in the past year or two when this data has been analyzed by other people is that the grading of the neurologic recovery did not employ any functional measures of outcome. They couldn't tell us that one person got up and walked or one person was able to raise his arm. Uh, thus we were, it was not possible to assess any clinical useful degrees of recovery with, with this. Now then NASA 3 came 519 patients, and, and interestingly, they kind of reconcluded that yes, steroids is good, and then if you start it within three hours, you get identical motor recovery in all three groups. If it's delayed for three to eight hours, uh, that the 48-hour methylprednisolone group recovered significantly more function. So they concluded that if you get to these people within three hours, you give the normal 
uh, 30 milligram bolus, you give the 5.4 kilogram per hour, uh, if within three hours. If you get within three to eight hours, you do it for 48 hours. Now, most there's been several anecdotal reports and some articles coming out now that this is a little too complicated for ERs and, and all of us to figure out. When did the patient injure his neck? Does that start when you come in the emergency room? It's, it's become fairly complicated. And I will say that uh, I think most of us are in agreement now, including uh, Barth Green, the Miami Institute, Tom Ducker, et cetera, that this whole steroid thing, I don't want to use the word nonsense, but there has been no one to show that this has been advantageous. There are several critical reviews now of the NASA's three that uh, bring this very controversial. I'm not sure how long this will remain, quote, uh, standard of care. Um, we'll just go on here. There's been a lot of other chemicals involved, the lazaroids, the gangliosides, a lot of research gone into these. None of them at this point have been shown to do a darn thing when you give to that patient. They've been used on the NFL football field, and they're even uh, in some of the packs, uh, that, in the uh, sets on the NFL fields uh, to try and use them. Um, the gangliosides has had, got some real publicity in 91, uh, demonstrating neurologic improvement. Uh, with this study uh, in paralyzed patients, not paretic, many multicenter trials have been in progress. Not much has come out of that. Uh, the fast potassium channel blockers have been shown to enhance nerve conduction. Uh, there are limited clinical trials. Nothing has really been shown to benefit with this. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy there. Bottom line is there is no miracle chem chemical that we give in the emergency room uh, that changes much of these traumatic spinal cord injuries. I'll go back to this case that uh, showed a complete, complete spinal cord injury that happened uh, on the beach. Uh, surfing transected the cord. This was a very healthy 17-year-old athlete. Uh, we got to surgery, was flown in. Uh, we got to surgery. I was in surgery three hours after this injury, completely a C5 quadriplegic, and did surgery, decompressed it. Here is the study three weeks later. The canal is completely decompressed, but notice the tremendous secondary involvement of that area uh, that right there was a transection of the cord. This gentleman did get a, uh, a recovery of his C6 nerve root but got no further cord compression. He's now three years out from this. Um, timing, what can you say about that? Did it matter that we did it in three hours? If you've got such severe injury of that cord, timing has nothing to do with it. It may have an effect as we'll talk about in some of the incompletes or the problem is you're not sure right off the bat many times who's incomplete or complete or how badly that spinal cord is is injured. Let's look a little bit into the spinal cord regeneration. When you do have a complete transection of the spinal cord or a spinal cord that has no electrical conductivity going through it, uh, we're doing a lot of research. Many people are stimulating axonal regrowth with nerve growth factors, uh, the neurotropins, and these selectively encourage axon growth, hopefully from the brain to the cord. Uh, here's from our lab over the past year and a half. We have been able to take, uh, and this is from a rat spinal cord, have been able to take that spinal cord cell and stimulate it to grow. Now, one of the ma major problems we have is getting all the f uh, fibrosis out of there. And what we've been doing is adding several chemicals. One of the most interesting right now are the BMP, the bone morphogenic proteins. Uh, and here within about 10 days, you can see the tremendous growth of that neuron uh, stimulated with BMP. Now, we have uh, 